Well, welcome everyone. Thanks for coming to our second uh, group of presentations for the fall 2018 term. Uh, my name is James and we're coming to you from the McMaster Health Forum uh, at McMaster University. So welcome. Uh, an agenda for today's presentations, I will give you a quick rundown of the McMaster Health Forum, uh, our current Queen Elizabeth Scholarship Program, our new scholarship program, and then I'll turn it over to our presenters. We have two groups, of, three groups of presenters. Uh, the first two are outgoing scholars. Uh, the first group of three went to Malaysia. The second uh, scholar went to England. And then we have a special guest, our first incoming scholar from our new scholarship program, uh, who's visiting us from Colombia. Uh, and we will end things off with uh, a question and answer session. So the McMaster Health Forum is a leading hub for improving health outcomes through collective problem solving. We aim to harness information, convene stakeholders, and prepare action-oriented leaders, and act as an agent of change by empowering stakeholders. The Queen Elizabeth Scholarship Program is run by a partnership between the Rita Hall Foundation, Community Foundations of Canada, Universities Canada, and individual Canadian universities. The purpose of the program is to activate dynamic community of young global leaders across the Commonwealth to create lasting impacts both at home and abroad through cross-cultural exchanges encompassing international education, discovery and inquiry, and professional experiences. The version of the Queen Elizabeth Scholarship uh, Program that's offered here at the McMaster Health Forum is called Strengthening Health Systems. Our scholars will contribute to strengthening health systems and become part of our large and growing network of health system leaders. We have been honored to receive a second Queen Elizabeth Scholarship Program, which is just starting. Uh, applications are in full swing uh, for 2019. Um, so uh, we are one of 20 Canadian institutions to host this next round of scholars uh, in the scholarship program, and it will run from 2018 through to the end of 2021. This new program is called the Queen Elizabeth Scholarship Program in Strengthening Health and Social Systems. So we see there's a slight change in our focus. Uh, this new program is very similar to the one that is just ending. Uh, there are some uh, differences that I'll just note very quickly. The uh, location of the internships is expanded. So the old program was all Commonwealth countries. Uh, we are now able to expand that to include uh, low and middle income countries as well. Our partners, because of that, have changed. So we now have partnerships uh, in Colombia and Lebanon uh, with other potential ones uh, on the horizon. And the focus of those internships has changed slightly to include social systems along with health systems. And because of this, our eligible programs have changed. So we, uh, all of the same graduate programs are still eligible, but we have added the arts and science program at the undergraduate level. And the number of opportunities has changed. So we, by the end of the program that's currently ending, we will have hosted or sent abroad 61 scholars. Uh, in this new program, program, we will only be hosting or sending abroad 24 scholars. So you see there's quite a difference in the number of scholarships that we are able to offer. Speaking of that old program, uh, we divided them into three different cohorts. This first cohort primarily went away or visited us in 2016. We had a good mix of incoming scholars, outgoing scholars, and outgoing interns. Our second group was the largest group. Uh, this cohort primarily went away or visited us in 2017. You see that was a large group of scholars that uh, went abroad during the summer of 2017. And our presenters today, at least the first four of them, are part of this cohort. Uh, this is the cohort that primarily went away in the summer that's just passed in 2018. We also hosted a large incoming scholar contingent uh, during the summer of 2018. Uh, and we currently have five scholars who are abroad uh, as I, we do this presentation. Um, a bit about myself, I'm Robert Rettelmeyer. I'm the first um, arts and science student to be a Queen Elizabeth Scholar. I've specialized in statistics during my time in arts and science. And over the summer, I was at the British Medical Journal. Um, so there are three things I'd like to do today. First is discuss what the BMJ does and how it fits into health systems. Second, I'd like to discuss a bit about what I did at the British Medical Journal over my three months there. And, second, and third, I'd like to discuss a bit about what it was like to be in London over this summer, and especially in the context of strengthening health systems. So first, I'd like to discuss what the BMJ is. And I'm sure many of you have had exposure to the BMJ, or I hope you have if you've come across articles published in it or in or in one of its many, many subsidiary journals. But even if you're a scientist, and even if you have published in the BMJ, the, some, one sense I got is that there's very little actual understanding of what the behind the scenes looks like. 
so much, so almost every physician, almost every scientist will engage with the world of medical publishing, but very few of them will necessarily look behind the scenes. They, may, they will serve as author, they will serve as reviewer, they will receive emails from editors, they will write emails to editors, uh, occasionally angry emails to editors, but they will not ever serve as editor themselves. So what does the BMJ do? Its mission, um, as formulated by Richard Smith, the previous editor-in-chief, is to publish rigorous, accessible, and entertaining material that will help doctors and medical students in their daily practice, lifelong learning, and career development, in addition to be at the forefront of the international debate on health, and also to produce sufficient surplus to develop the primary mission and in good years to invest in the rest of the group and contribute to the activities of the British Medical Association. So if you're, if you're a doctor, you have seen many of these mission statements and found, find them dry and uninteresting. You all may also think that it's dry and uninteresting, but there are a few uh, particularly salient points that I'd like to pull out because they are relevant to my experience as Queen Elizabeth Scholar. The most important one is that, that sort of middle one, to be at the forefront of the international debate on health. Medical journals don't just contribute, or it's more that articles and scientific articles are obviously not the only component of what the international debate on health looks like. All the discussions that previous uh, scholars have had and within health departments, those are part of the international debate on health. But medical journals do have a unique role. Not only do they publish articles, they get to make those decisions. Which articles do they publish? Which do they not? Which do they think are relevant? Which do they not? Which articles do they commission? Which collections do they commission? Which would be a collection of articles themed on a specific topic. These are decisions that are largely in the hands of medical journals and largely opaque to outside view. You can see every article that the BMJ has published. You cannot see every article that the BMJ has not published. And there's good reason for that, but it also it means that this is an element of the medical debate that is almost solely in the hands of these publishing organizations. Uh, the BMJ's vision, which is a bit more snappy, is to be the world's most influential and widely read medical journal. Note first what's not there. It's not to be the most cited medical journal, though the BMJ, like every medical journal, does have to worry about its impact factor. It's not to be the most profitable medical journal. It's not to be the most widely read by doctors medical journal, or the most widely read by policymakers medical journal to be the most influential and widely read medical journal. And the point about influence is also one that makes the BMJ unique, that sets it apart from things like the Lancet or the New England Journal of Medicine or even Nature and Science, is that the BMJ truly believes in influencing policy, influencing debate, influencing health systems. One primary mechanism of that is its campaigns, which are organized sort of causes that it devotes itself to. One of these was evidence-based medicine. The British Medical Journal was one of the first journals to really embrace that cause. Um, one which was a particularly relevant example, because at Happily I was there, on around May 30th, the British Medical Journal launched a new campaign, Scrap the Cap. Uh, England had a cap on the number of visas it awarded uh, people to come to work in the NHS, and the cap was deemed to be too low, and it meant that, there were in, that people were being kicked out of the country after they had, say, gone on their medical training because they, wasn't a, they couldn't get a visa to work here, and which was alarming given that the NHS was already facing a labor shortage. So what did that do? They, they created a petition, they published editorials, um, they held a sort of short conference, and within 14 days, the Home Secretary announced he was reviewing the cap, Two days after that, the cap was abolished. So that's within the span of three weeks, a policy was changed, not because of the, well, because of the advocacy of variety groups and because of the central organization of the British Medical Journal. It is not going to sit on the sidelines and be an impartial referee, as some journals are, and there's validity to that. It is going to take up causes, and it is going to fight for them. So what did I do at the British Medical Journal? Some of what I did was editing, which, which is obviously a, a major component of the journal. A large amount of its employees are editors. They are also journalists. They are copy editors. They are the layout 
specialists, they're the graphical designers, but uh, the core of the British Medical Journal is the editing team, the editing process. I did not focus on the research articles, the systematic reviews say that you might come across that health systems evidence. I did not focus on the education articles, which are geared towards doctors in terms of making them be a better doctor, uh, whether that's improving their skills or procedures or teaching them what their patients are thinking. I focus on the analysis section, which is aims to be evidence-informed argument, somewhere in between editorial and research. And it's really, I was really lucky to be there that my supervisor was the editor, was the head editor of the section, and that it was a place where my skill set from the health forum and from arts and science really came into play. Where even if the research content itself was beyond me, I could evaluate the argument, I could critically appraise it using the skills I've been taught. Um, in arts and science, or I could evaluate their approach to evidence and see whether it seemed they were picking and choosing or were, were truly being vigorous in their approach, as the health forum has trained me to do. I also led um, a project looking at gender dynamics and peer review, and this was something that took up the bulk of my time, so I'd like to uh, explain it a bit further. There's What was really interesting to me about peer review was that it was one place where the British Medical Journal had almost sole control over its internal practices. We, the British Medical Journal cannot control really what articles are submitted to it. Though it can go out and commission articles, it can um, do various things to encourage authors to submit, to submit and to submit particular types of articles. And nor can entirely control, or it can entirely control what it publishes, but that's a hugely, hugely multifactorial process that there are so many concerns there and so many weights there and so many have to do with the content of the article. It's not somewhere that the BMJ necessarily has much sort of flexibility. It has its standards, it has its processes, and those standards and its processes are what make it the BMJ and what allow it to be rigorous um, and scientific. But it's, there's a lot to that in between. Um, and one major component of that, and in all science, is peer review process by which articles get vetted and appraised um, that inform their rejection or acceptance and definitely inform their editing. So what I wanted to focus on was the gender dynamics within that. In particular, who gets invited to peer review? Are we mostly inviting white men because most of science is white men uh, or has traditionally been white men and if we're trying to invite experts in their fields who are perceived as experts nowadays, um, Unfortunately, there's a long legacy of the experts being the white men um, in the field. So I want to see whether that was still being maintained despite some of the work that the British Medical Journal has done on improving diversity within its team and within its uh, publication. The editor-in-chief for the past decade or so, Fiona Godley, has really been a leader um, in this regards. So what I did was evaluate precisely who are we inviting and who are most major, major medical journals inviting. So I began with a look at The Lancet, the New England Journal of Medicine, the British Medical Journal, and the Journal of the American Medical Association. By all accounts, uh, the four sort of largest, most influential medical journal, uh, general medical journals in the world. Um, no publication came close to 50% in terms of the invitation rate. The New England Journal was at something like 20%, Lancet and JAMA were in the area of 30%. The BMJ was a bit better, closer to 35 40%, but still far removed. And what was noticeable was that there wasn't actually much change. I looked at it over the course of a decade, a decade that's been fairly momentous, a decade that's a long time in science, um, but hasn't been a long time, clearly, in the trends of these medical publishers. But what's interesting about peer review as well, and what was the most striking thing I actually possibly I took away was that it is really, it's almost absurd that the, the fact that peer review works, the fact that so much of scientific rigor is based upon the unpaid labor of very brilliant, talented, hardworking people with a ton of stuff on their plate, the fact that so much of science is based on asking them to do labor, so when you look at, say, a stat that's the New England Journal, uh, maybe 25% of its reviewers are women, is that because they're doing things to intentionally exclude those perspectives from peer review? Or is it because women are smarter and therefore making the decision that, wait, I don't want to give my unpaid labor to 
uh, New England Journal of Medicine, I would like to spend it doing my research, or perhaps it's otherwise eaten up by a variety of uh, responsibilities that are unfairly pushed upon them. So then I wanted to look, and I had the opportunity to look more closely at what the BMJs actual, actually did, um, because I had access to a sort of its internal, pro internal processes in a way I didn't for JAMA, the Lancet, or the New England Journal, and that I could look at who is invited for each article. And I did that, and it was still um, very little change, let's say, in that the majority of people being invited were still men. There were many, around 15% of articles, not a single woman was invited. And this was sort of what I presented to the senior editors group around at the end of my time at the British Medical Journal. And what I, what I gathered from them was that it really it wasn't something that they had been thinking about, but it was something that they could change to think about in that when a peer review decision is made, it's not some algorithm. It's not some, there's no sort of secret counsel. It's the editor who's assigned to the article, goes, does some reading in Google Scholar, consults the BMJ's internal database, figure out, figures out a few people they think would be pertinent, invites them. The editors hadn't been thinking about whether they were getting a diversity of gender or necessary national perspectives. Um, and at least they communicated that it was something that they were going to try to do going forwards. Um, so third, I'd like to talk about what my time in London was like. And it was a very uh, interesting, let's say, summer to be in London. First, there's the continuing developments over Brexit, which were sort of flying fast and furious this summer. In all honesty, I appreciate it at times. It was the more Brexit drama, the better the exchange rate got, which was a nice uh, little bonus. But it, was also, it also had ramifications in the health sphere. Um, after sort of a particular spat, the Sheffield Agreement, Jeremy Hunt, the previous um, health minister, sort of stepped down for a new position, and it was taken up by Matt, Matt Hancock. Um, it was also the 70th anniversary, anniversary of the National Health Service, so there was a lot of internal debate about how it's been doing, um, reflecting on those 70 years and what the next uh, decade, the next 70 years should look like. It was also the World Cup, in which, London, er, which, in which England made it the furthest it's been in generations, uh, which was impossible to avoid sort of being exposed to while in London. Um, you really did my, my sense of... London and the opportunities granted to me as Queen Elizabeth Scholar, both formally at the BMJ and also the flexibility when and how kind people could be when you email them and say, I'm a Queen Elizabeth Scholar um, from Canada, do you mind if I talk to you about this or that? It really gave me a sense of just how much London is a hub of the world and of, <clears throat> and of the global health world. It's truly a place where you can get perspectives from the English perspective, the North American perspective, the perspectives from around Europe and around the globe. Um, I was lucky enough to attend the uh, BMG, the BMJ's once every two years editorial advisory board meeting, <coughs> where they bring in experts from around the globe to sort of inform their uh, continued development. And it, I was also able to attend events on the ethics of genomics data, the conference by the Health Foundation, which is a, a non-governmental organization that funds quite a bit of health research. Um, and in particular, I was very fortunate I was able to sit in on a, a meeting, an editorial meeting at The Lancet, the BMJ's perhaps biggest rival, the, and one of, another one of these major medical journals, but I'll, I'm not ashamed to admit an impact factor that dwarfs the BMJ's. Um, and the contrasts were particularly interesting. The, the extent to which they focused more on pure research and how the research would be used and less on maybe the, the stuff that the health form focuses on, which are the, the synthesis of research. The, because one randomized controlled trial isn't good enough. We need the systematic reviews. We need the meta-analyses, um, which was an interesting lens to bring to a journal that was quite focused on this trial and that trial because they were important, because they wanted to disseminate this sort of cutting-edge novel research. I, oh, so that would lead me to say that 
It really is. And the, I guess what the contrast really showed was just how much flexibility there is here and how little, um, how non-transparent it, it is to the outside world. That you can attend these two, I could attend these two editorial meetings and find them so different in terms of structure, in terms of style, in terms of what content is discussed, uh, in terms of how the content is discussed. And these really, these decisions that will shape what medical scientists see in the immediate presence what, and what will shape the, what the corpus of scientific literature looks like over for the rest of um, history, as it were, that there is so much difference and that there's so little, it's, so, it's impossible to necessarily see that difference from the outside, that you can see what they publish, but you can't see the decision-making process behind that. Um, I mentioned The Lancet, which will lead me on to my last section, where I have quite a few people to say thank you. Um, at The Lancet, I have thanks to Jocelyn Clark, a fellow actually Canadian in London, who's a senior editor there um, and hosted me. There are also quite a few people I have thanks at the British Medical Journal, from Fiona Godley, the editor-in-chief, who was, ha was almost absurdly happy to have an undergraduate student there. I felt very welcomed. Um, I didn't expect them to be mean, but I did not expect them to be as nice as they really were. Um, my supervisor in particular, Navjoit Ladder, who's, a, who's a, the editor of the analysis section and truly a, a brilliant person. Um, and in particular, I owe quite a bit of thanks to the Health Forum. I won't get too into the details, but I remember my, when I first applied to work at the Health Forum, I was rejected. And it, I got that, that sad email, it wasn't a few days later that I got another email saying, actually, wait, we have a project um, we, we'd like you to work on if you're still interested. And from that very moment, I felt truly blessed to uh, have this opportunity. And over the, that was sort of at the start of second year, I'm now moving into my fourth year. And I, that feeling of being blessed to work with the people I have, um, mentored by the people I, I have, given the opportunities I have, hasn't at all gone away. Um, James, thank you truly very much from the bottom of my heart. You've been kind to me when I haven't always deserved kindness, generous to me when I haven't always deserved generosity. Um, and truly, it's an incredible institution, incredibly unique institution um, that I owe more than I can say to. Thank you.